When you think about it, data centers are probably the most important buildings in the 21st century, because without data centers, everything stops working. But if you're like me, you probably have no idea what actually happens inside a data center. So a few days ago, I was thrilled to be able to sit down and chat to Zander Rose, who recently had an exclusive look inside an automatic data center. Zander has recently started work for Automatic, who are the parent company of WordPress.com. And in this video, you're gonna learn all about how data centers actually work. Let's dive in. It's always been a bit of an interesting area because it's a huge black box for most people. Most people understand their websites are hosted at hosting companies. They have absolutely no idea what that means. So I want you to take us inside there and explain what you saw, really. So can you start from the beginning? What happened? Where were you? And what did you do? I just very recently started at Automatic, and it came out of a conversation. Um, I've known Matt Mullenweg for a number of years. He was, he's was he been involved in the Long Now Foundation, where I was the director for 27 years or so. And the main our main project was how to get people to think longer term. And one of those sub-projects became how do we store information as a society, as a larger civilization that is potentially useful in the future? And how do we determine what might be useful or not now in order to do that? And I've done several archival projects. And then in talking with Matt about the 100-year data plan, he said, he asked me if I wanted to work on it. And starting basically at the beginning of February, I started working with Automatica on this. And, and one of the very first things that I wanted to do is get a sense of what's the baseline of how Automatic is presently hosting data. And I knew that this happened at data centers. I didn't, at that time, I didn't know how much of the data infrastructure Automatic built out themselves versus uh, how a lot of even the largest companies use the other big data providers like AWS. They are built into strategic areas around the country and around the world that also gets them on big data trunk lines, often redundant large data trunk lines, in some cases redundant power lines like and power grids like this particular facility. And it's a mix of, if I think if, if people could have, if data centers had their druthers, they could They'd all be built in Alaska where it's super cold outside. And so they built this data center park around a, sub, a power substation that happens to be connected to both the east and the western Texas power grids. So I've never been to a data center or data center and security is a huge issue, right? Are they like when you walk up to them, does it say this is a data center or is there some secrecy around what they actually are, what's going on in there? So when you drive in the corner of that office park, all the buildings were surrounded by a very large fence yeah. and you had to go into like a car trap when you go through and show all your IDs that are pre-cleared. Yeah. And then they open up the inside of the car trap and then you go in and then you, you have to like, just finding the building was hard. They're just gray. It's like a lot of important infrastructure in cities is behind gray walls and gray fences with no markings. And that's how it's important. And you get into the building, you do the IDs again, get biometrics, and then they then you go into a man trap thing that holds a few people in the doors and they let us in five people at a time. So it's pretty interesting level. I, there's not a lot, there wasn't any armed security guards there, but it was pretty, pretty interesting level of security being taken definitely seriously. The building that we are in has multiple what are called data halls. And they have, within those data halls, they may have multiple customers like the one that, that we were in. And so yeah. those customers also then have a last layer of security, which the, the facility gives you a cage and your key to that cage that where your servers may go. But some of the, some of the other customers there also put fences around their servers inside of that cage. They sometimes mm -hmm. obscured their cage, sub cage, some cases they went through the floor that's a three foot subfloor to make sure that no one could crawl through the subfloor into their data wow. cage. Right. Um, and the they take that stuff very seriously, I assume because some of the obscuring might be because they're making proprietary ways of serving the data and they don't want other, they know that other people that could be competition be walking through the hall and be able to study it, take pictures of it. There's, yes. You're not allowed to take pictures at all when you're in there by the agreement with the the company that oh, really so does. essentially you've got one provider well, i'm simplifying but my understanding is you you've got one provider and then people like automatic will come in and lease space and then put their own automatic put their own physical hardware in that space and manage that themselves right 
That's right. So the the facility offers cooling, fire protection, the basic sec- the security, the power, and they also provide well provide they they charge uh, for what's called the interconnect. Uh, I believe. And so this particular facility, which my understanding is that this is not necessarily the case across all facilities like this, but it's basically data provider agnostic, meaning you can contract any data provider that's willing to bring internet into the the main called demarcation point in the building, which is a big board. And then they charge you to interconnect that to your servers. And so you can bring in two data providers, three, four, and then they have they, they put in this a piece of fiber from there to your data hall and they charge you monthly for that connection and then so automatic brings in at least two providers into the dmark point pays for the inter pays for two main fiber interconnects over to the data hall and and then they go into two routers at the head of each set of racks that they have and then those are redundantly brought out with it's it's a new standard that I didn't know about. It's not ethernet. It's it's got these kind of media converters at either end. It's faster than even the fastest ethernet. So the cooling and power backup power systems are outside the I guess the first layer of backup power system was inside which is which is these somewhat unique to this facility is my understanding they use these flywheel based power backups by yeah. a company called Active I was, Power. I was researching those today. Explain how they work. Yeah, generator is basically just a motor that's run backwards, right? Yeah. Um, a motor takes power in to a spinning thing with magnets on it, and that gives us electricity. But it, the same thing, roughly, if it's if you turn that wheel, you can get power out of it, or if that wheel is turning, you can get power out of it as well, even if it's not just as it spins down. And so, with these are flywheels that are in a vacuum chamber so that they have, they take very, and they use very high precision on ceramic bearings. So that means the balls of the ball bearing are ceramic as well as the races that they're running in. I was surprised. I thought that they run on like maglev bearings, but I guess they don't. So they're looking for the lowest friction environment possible. So they'd remove the air from it. They use these high precision bearings. And in normal operation, basically that flywheel, which is the motor as well, is power is put into it to just keep it spinning at 10,000 RPMs. Wow. Okay. With a lot of weight on it. The moment the power goes out, then that system is reversed and it starts pulling power out of that system. It turns that motor into a generator and th- and it, that can happen in milliseconds, just like battery uh, backups, which is what most facilities now yeah. use. Yeah. And there were some battery backups also at this facility, some of the some of the people added another layer of that. But those things can only last, they're like 40 seconds of power to the servers. And the, and so that they are only there to give the big giant diesel generators, which are outside, okay. enough time to crank up, come up to speed, get their power ready and do the switch over. Yeah. And that should only take under 10 seconds. So okay. that's so this, that first layer of power is only needed for this very short amount of time. And so the nice thing about something like a flywheel is that it doesn't have batteries that need to be replaced all the time. A battery backup system every three to five years, you have to replace all these very expensive batteries that you might yeah. not have used a single time. So are these, uh, are these flywheels having any purpose when things are running smoothly, apart from just running 24-7 no, in, in case no, they're, something happens? They're, yeah, they're taking power just to keep them at speed. But since they're in a vacuum with high precision bearings, keeping them at speed is very you know, you spin them up the first time and that takes as much energy as you, you know, basically okay. as you can get out of them. But no, they're not doing anything until the power goes out. They're just uh, waiting, poised. For they're just, they're just spinning at 10,000 RPMs. And then after uh, their 40 seconds of activity and purpose in life, you, the generators get about 24 hours, I think. Is that right? Before they run 48 out? 48 is what they said. So, so it was a series of four or six of these nearly house-sized generators that are four megawatts each Um, and and there's a bunch of them and then underneath them was they have 4500 gallon diesel tanks that that and those things burn basically 100 gallons an hour when they're operating okay which is pretty interesting yes that's a gallon and 1.4 gallons a minute right so you're 
Yeah. It's like you're basically pouring a bucket of wa- of fuel into this thing about as fast as you could pour a bucket of fuel every minute to keep it going. It um, brings home how much power these things consume, though, doesn't it, when you visualize it like that? Yeah, exactly. So those are the that's the long-term power backup. If an emergency goes on beyond 48 hours, they have contracts, the facilities have contracts with fuel companies that come and start filling up these tanks okay. again. But it was one of these interesting conversations I had. The time where the power, like both power grids goes down to that, that's probably a like a, an emergency that's statewide mm. where, you know, maybe a hurricane that's made a deep landfall. And it's possible in those cases where there's huge fuel shortages. The roads are blocked by tons of traffic from people trying to get in and out. The roads could be blocked from other reasons of emergencies. The, the other thing that we saw outside was the cooling system, which is, it's, it was interesting. It's, I guess it's an air conditioning system, but it, it uses um, salinated water, these giant salinated water tanks as the way that they, it's not a total loss system like a, and then that goes into the cooling system. The, the other interesting thing that I learned from them is that uh, the power going out is actually the least of the problems. And so usually with the, the power going out means that the cooling can go down. But if the cooling system were to go down independently of that actually shuts the servers down in less than an hour. Okay. Uh, and so the servers have thermal protection built into them. And that as soon as the temperature starts rising, they start going into, they start slowing down their processors so that they're putting out less heat and they go into this kind of brownout phase, which is in a way is actually diff- more difficult for the system to understand than just turning off because it's trying to still get data out of them and they're just slowing down and slowing down. But at a certain point they do, they just shut off probably about an hour into the cooling stopping. So the cooling systems themselves are also very redundant, but they do rely on the power. It sounds a little bit like a nuclear power station, the same sort of importance on cooling. Exactly. Which we we learned horrifically out of Japan. It's not so much the nuclear thing. It's the cooling thing that that becomes the real issue. And yeah, so similar in that way. And so then we went back inside, we went to the data hall. The interesting thing I think that we, that I learned in there is that I had this idea that they would try and that all the drives and cables and servers were all going to be of one generation all built mm-hmm. out at one time. But it you know made quick sense after he starts explaining it that you build these server systems out within three years, you can't buy any of that stuff again, you're not going to get the exact same batch of hard drives. So when they buy these things, they also buy like batches of the same hard drives and cables and things. So hard drives, even within the server systems themselves are using RAID. Um, And then we went to the data hall and the data hall is like insanely loud and cold and it's a horrible place to be. (laughs) Everybody wants to do the least amount of work in the data hall itself. Uh, How loud is it? Can you you talk to each other? Was it absolutely booming? uh, You had to like shout at each other within normal few feet of speaking distance. So it's you, if you were five feet away from someone, you basically, they had to really scream at you to hear it. So it's loud. Um, Do you know what's making that noise? Is it just the energy consumption or is it? It's fans. It's fans fans and a million servers and a big box store size room full of these things. And so it's a, it's just a lot of air moving. Plus there's the air moving from the air conditioning systems that are coming up through the floor. Do you know, Uh, do you know what's, what, consumes the most power in a data center? Is it the cooling systems or is it the, the servers, just the energy they consume? I believe the normal mark is 1.3 is cooling. So if you put the data server in Norway or Alaska or Antarctica, yeah. uh, then you get a better cooling factor. You use less energy cooling than when you do on a 110 degree Fahrenheit day in Texas. The, in this facility, they pump the the power and the cooling all comes in through the subfloor, which is again three feet off of uh, the the ground um, through you know panels that you can pull up. Um, they even had clear panels in certain areas so that you can see where some of the junction points are. I guess that's those are more higher maintenance points. Yeah. Um, and then all the data comes in over raceways over your head, um, and they drop down. So I think they're trying to separate those things. You can get uh, EMF from high power that can mess with data cables. So they're trying to separate those by eight feet or so. And so the power comes in and the cooling comes in through the floor. The data comes in to each end of the, the rows of servers. At the other end, the, the 
top end of the servers have vents that go to a drop ceiling that actually has 30 feet of space apparently above it to the real roof of the building. Wow. And that becomes a place where they pump heat for and then pull the heat out above at the roof to the intercoolers. And so that also gives a buffer of a certain amount of space where heat can go in the case of cooling systems dying for a while. And then the other interesting thing is that the the data, different types of data are served on different types of technology. So the images are served, which are large file size. They, they're served on spinning disks that, that are cheaper to replace, but also fail sooner because they have physical parts to them. Then things like the database and text data and things like that is served through non-moving disk technology. Your whole background is around the longevity of data and how we preserve information. And so did, did this- And visit... physical things too, but yeah. Okay, and did this, did, this, did this visit change your perception on how likely that is to happen? Did it make you more positive? I roughly knew what this these kind of facilities were uh, yeah. conceptually. I very much wanted to see one in person and I really wanted to ground truth the way that automatic was doing it to see if it seemed like it was living up to best practices as I understand them. And I was pleasantly surprised that it was beyond the best practices that I understood them. And in what way? Just to dive into that. Just how much um, how much redundancy across multiple data centers, even within the data centers, the redundancy that costs a lot of money to maintain the outside one. And there's just a lot of care given to all of that. And so I was, the first thing I wanted to see is, would I have any recommendations about the way that Automatic is currently saving data? As the first layer of what I want to do with Automatic is have a story about how your data can last for a long time. And the first part of that story is how we're taking care of it. And so I am highly confident that as long as Automatic is around as a company, everybody's data is being handled at the best possible way. 